I think that this is a business. There are those who are not just in Uganda, but various different countries in, in, in Africa and in India too, who have realized that there is big, big money in convincing people that sacrificing a child will make them rich. Children are murdered for money. Hi, welcome on the edge, Annie Iqbal. How are you doing? Very well, thank you. Very, very happy to be here, finally. Yeah, we've been trying for a while, haven't we? It's really nice to get you here. And your equipment's great. Everything's great. I'm very happy. Tell me a bit about your background and the productions you've worked on over the years. Yeah, so I am a freelance video editor. I work mainly in sort of reality, entertainment. Um, I think what most people call trash, trash TV, I guess. Um I love it. But I love it. Uh, love Island. Uh, I've worked on Strictly, Come Dancing, I'm a Celeb, Get Me Out of Here, uh, Made in Chelsea, Towie, Too Hot to Handle, just finished that. That was really good. Um, so yeah, I work on a broad broad range of, of shows, but all se- seemingly in the same sort of genre. But um, I very much enjoy my job, yeah. In, in general, how much do you sort of push them around let's say love island how much are they sort of pushed to have certain conversations obviously not going to answer that (laughs) (laughs) i mean they aren't um it's reality it's sort of you know obviously within the spectrum of um you know it's a television show right so um being very very careful not to say something that's gonna make sure i'm never hired again um it's unscripted it really is unscripted i think there's like this massive misconception that made in chelsea the only way is essex they're given this kind of script before um before they're filmed and they are not they really are not fair enough and you're right i don't want to i don't want to prod you on that because i don't want to get you in trouble (laughs) moving on yeah (laughs) yeah moving on but this is the thing so i mean you you, it's it's fairly um reality show fairly superficial and but a lot of us love it and i enjoy watching it myself and you do learn a bit about society and things but how did you get involved in the kind of activism that you've you've been doing that we're going to talk about today uh well do you know i don't there's this thing about the word activism that just sounds a bit um like I want to say Ponzi, but I don't, I don't, I, it sounds like activism is kind of like saved for the middle class, really posh loaded kids who are rebelling against their really loaded parents. And I'm just not that at all. So I would not consider myself an activist. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, it's not, it's not that at all. We need another word. We need, yeah. I don't know. What would you, what would you suggest? Um, impactful um, stuff. Um, I don't know. I think... I think it got to a point where I was I was working and you know enjoying my job but feeling a little bit kind of like mm, there could be something else kind of out there and I wanted a bit of a change and I uh reached out to a lady who ran a baby's home in Uganda and she sort of looked often looked for and needed TV people to go over there and shoot films and edit them and stuff and I very quickly agreed and you know, um, went to Uganda. I think it was only supposed to be about three months and I ended up staying six or seven in the first, in the first instance. And, um, at this baby's home, which is a little bit like it's somewhere in between a baby's home and a rescue center. There are children there from the ages of like zero to 11, 12, um, who have been sort of either found abandoned or rescued from their homes. Um, bought to this baby's home and, you know, they try and basically find Ugandan families to adopt these kids. And there was one girl there who um, had, I was told, survived child sacrifice. And it was through her and the organization that I, I learned I learned quite a lot about what this practice is and the effects it's had on on the country. Was that a shock for you to learn about? I mean, did you know that that existed? Not specifically child sacrifice. I knew that you know, there was such things as the occult and I knew about witchcraft through my dad, who's Nigerian, but I had, I hadn't ever heard about like sacrifice. And obviously like there are sacrifices that are made, but it's always to do with animals and chickens and, um, 
goats, um, which is very, very common, but never had I heard of, of, of humans being sacrificed and certainly not children. Yeah, it's, it's really quite unnerving and, and scary. I thought the same as you. And I thought it was maybe like, I don't know, an old wife's tale or maybe even like a xenophobic thing about, oh, these other countries where that happens. I suppose it's, it must, is it em- embarrassing for a lot of people from those countries that this goes on are, are, are people in in those in in these countries in the cities are they aware of this happening do you know what is i wouldn't say embarrassed i think there's there's obviously a lot of shame right um there's a lot of shame i think people do realize it's happening um you can't not however it's not so much a taboo subject right it's People aren't open about it unless you really ask the questions. And I found when I heard about this and I went researching, um, people were really kind of hesitant at first to talk about it, but it only took a little bit of digging and scratching the surface and they were just unearthed all of these awful stories that they were so obviously keen to talk about and needed for themselves, you know, to, to explain to someone, even though I was a foreigner, what was happening in their country because it felt to me as though they'd never been asked, um, yet they really wanted to communicate this horror that was happening all around them. So um, do people know about it? Yes. Um, people are willing to talk about it, but you just got to ask the questions and ask the right questions. Is it a horror for everyone? Because I guess some of these people are carrying out the practice. So for those people, have, did you speak to any of those people and were they sort of defending the practice no of course like no one would out, like outright come out and say that they had um however i i made like a, a little documentary about it more as much for me really to sort of help document what i was hearing but also because at one point i wanted to take it to the government and just say look this is what's happening um and i met you know, survivors of child sacrifice. I met parents who'd lost their children. I interviewed the police, the judiciary, but I also, um, I also interviewed this witch doctor who had very recently given up the practice. I didn't and could not ask him outright if he had, if he had, you know, um, was involved in sacrificing children, but there was an air about him that he had done things that he was not proud of. So, uh, yeah, I kind of got close. I met this one woman. In fact, yes, I met this one woman. Um, I won't say where. And she um, did actually admit to sacrificing children. I had completely forgotten about this. Um, I was not actually traveling. I wasn't I wasn't actually specifically working on this side of, um, you know, on, on researching, researching child sacrifice at all. I met her completely by chance. And I got talking about what I was doing. And she said that her family had um forced her or introduced her to the occult and she had been sort of um born into this um idea that you know when you sacrifice children it will lead to riches and prosperity and uh, she was forced to carry out these things and she was deeply deeply ashamed um the conversation lasted couldn't have lasted more than 5 minutes and she was just desperate to get out of her situation. I don't know if she was continuing, you know, if she was still doing it then. But um, yeah, I'd, it's so weird. I'd completely forgotten about that. And it's something that I, I wish I'd remembered a long time ago because, yeah, I don't know. Perhaps I could have, I probably would have behaved a bit differently. I don't know, weirdly. Um, How so? Well, I was so wrapped up in like just trying to sort of get the message out there that this exists. But actually, weirdly, there are people who clearly are involved in this who are desperate to get out. Um, It probably wasn't a fight that I was able to take on at the time. But in hindsight, I wish I paid a bit more attention to that. And there's no way in hell I'll be able to find her now. Yeah, well, hindsight, it's one of those things as a journalist, isn't it? It's impossible. There's so many leads, aren't there? And you just can't possibly remember all of them and, you know. Yeah. You spoke of, of parents, um, you know, losing their children. I mean, so, so would it, is it often that one sacrifices one's own children or that they're sort of taken from, from the parents? Both. Um, so children, are, it's easier to sacrifice your own ch- children for um, accessibility um, reasons. Um, and also there is a myth that when you sacrifice your own child, your own blood, um, it uh it's whatever you're trying to do is more likely to work 
um, because it's a you know effectively a bigger sacrifice. But more often than not, um, children are abducted on their way to school um, or when they're sort of working in the fields, especially. So um, yeah, either either one of those. It must be terrifying. Um for the families and but i mean we do a lot on this podcast i'm always talking about you know cults and extreme ideologies and that even you know the banality of evil how how these beliefs can make even good people do awful awful things do you think these people when they're sacrificing their children i mean they must firstly they they really believe that it's going to bring good things do they have do you know of any beliefs they have about the child itself like okay now my child's going to go to heaven no and i haven't I haven't ever heard of that. No, um, no. Why have, have you? No, it's just because it's so it's so difficult to imagine a parent sacrificing their own child without, unless there was a reason. Like, okay, but uh, they're going to go to heaven, so it's okay. Well, I I can tell you why. I think it's not just. I think it's really easy to point the finger and say you're so fucking evil. You're you've done this to your child, and absolutely, I am not condoning it one bit. But there are you know, there's, there's two ends of this spectrum here. You've got the rich people who are sacrificing children to kind of maintain their wealth. And then you've got the really, really poor, impoverished, desperate people who are sacrificing children, their own children, to emerge from that poverty because they genuinely feel as though there is no other way. Um, they've been brainwashed, brain brainwashed by their community, brainwashed by the witch doctor that they're consulting. Um, so they absolutely genuinely believe that this will help them emerge from their poverty. Do, do you get the impression that even it's a really hard decision for them to make? Naturally, yeah. And and I suppose it's a difficult question, but I mean, do, do you have an impression of how they t typically go about sacrificing children? Uh, so they, I mean... Yeah, they obviously they they abduct the child, um, they obtain the child, and um, often they use chloroform uh, to knock the child out. Um, but <clears throat> they they sacrifice the child, i.e., remove organs and cut the child um, and take what they need. Often while the child is alive um, and conscious. So whether they uh, and chloroform is not like he's readily available um in uganda so yeah children are held down you know I, yeah you can imagine it um and you know it's obviously um incredibly harrowing uh, uh, because there are, there are those who have survived and can, can tell you what happened to them they remember the pain and uh, they remember and can identify uh the the perpetrators and their attackers so uh so yeah, what tradition? Well, what what normally happens is that they they take what they need from the child, um, and it's not normally the witch doctor who does this, uh, who does the cutting. Um, it's someone that they have employed, um, and then they then go back to the witch doctor with the body parts, and they are mixed in with ritual medicine by the witch doctor, uh, and you know. That a ritual is 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 um, made uh, to the uh, to the ancestors who have demanded this, and um, and yeah, that's that's the general kind of process. What did it make you feel like um, learning about this for the first time? Ah, oh, dirty! Like uh, the fact that I had been like blissfully walking around. Um, and living my life and not having a clue that this happened all at the time um, was just, I just felt really ashamed. And I think maybe that's why I um, just put so much of myself into doing anything that I could to to make some sort of difference and impact because um, I just felt so much guilt weirdly. And also I had this, you know, complete, I was completely inspired by this little girl Um and felt that I just had this kind of real kinship to her. I was seeing her every day and I just wanted to do her proud and do every other child um, proud who had, who had suffered at the hands of this practice. And, and this was this was a survivor. Um, mm. What was her story? So she, so when sacrifices are often made um, during election times um, to help 
bring good luck. They're often, um, you'll often find the bodies of children under construction sites to bless a building, mall, uh, apartment building. And this little girl uh, had been taken to a construction site. Um, a witch doctor had laid her down and just sprinkled herbs all around her and all over her body. And luckily a security guard had seen what was going on, stopped it and called the baby's home where I was working. And, um, and yeah, she was, she was brought to the, the baby's home, but she, I think was one of the cases where it was the parents who had ordered that because there was a nationwide appeal for her parents uh, to, you know, does anybody know this girl? Her picture was everywhere, all over the news and newspapers and nobody came forward. And we suspected that her parents could have been involved in in that. But she was, she, yeah, she, uh, it was awful. She was really quite a, sh- a shell of a human being when I met her. She was just terrified and visibly traumatized. And, you know, I just, I just loved her instantly. And I just wanted to learn about the practice that nearly killed her and... Yeah, we just got really, really close and I'm still in touch with her now. Did she start to recover upon being with you and and back to sort of normal life? Yeah, yeah, she did. Yeah, very like gradually. What's what's she up to now? So she's now um, living with um, a teacher who's fantastic. Um, She's got two brothers uh, living in a really nice um, house in a village um, surrounded by like pigs and sheep and not sheep sorry pigs and chicken and mango trees she's flourishing i'm going to see her next month oh wow she must love you though she must she must like see you as i mean how old is she now uh well we think that she was like obviously she didn't come with like documentation right but i think we think that she's probably be about 10 now or nine she just makes it out every year she's like oh, i think i'm seven i'm eight i'm nine because yeah <laughs> Um, but her birthday is the 1st of July. So I think um, her her parents picked that as it's, uh, I don't know, easy, middle of the year. And, and I suppose that security guard saved her life as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and like about a year after, I sort of started digging around and wanted to learn a bit more about her case. And I went to the police station where... Uh, the case was reported and they had lost, they had lost the, the case files. Um, so I couldn't, there's nothing exists on, on who found her, um, or anything because that's what I wanted to do next. What do you think that might mean that they've lost them? Um, I think it could mean lots of, lots of things. Um, lots of cases go missing. Um, and, uh, to be honest with you, I, I I can't say, and I wouldn't like to speculate. What's um Kampala like, and is that, is that where this is mostly going on, or is it the the rest of Uganda? Uh, it's happens all over. Normally in the the villages, um, there's particular districts where it's particularly prevalent, but it also happens in Kampala. But on the whole, Kampala is a wonderful, wonderful city. Um, when I first got there, I just instantly felt at home. Like the people are genuinely the the nicest people, the most welcoming. And I think that was really important doing the kind of work that I was doing that I felt like I had a, you know, a second home in a way. Um, And I felt for the most part safe there. Um, But it's really cool. The nightlife is amazing. Um, (laughs) Really good. Uh, There are amazing restaurants. You should go. I think you'd enjoy it. We can party there together. I'd love to. (laughs) Oh yeah! Oh, I would love that. <laughs> it's Man. honestly, it's so there's, good. There's so many places to see. I've only ever been to South Africa in in Africa. I did a, a rugby tour when I was younger, but that was beautiful. What a beautiful country! That, I suppose every country's beautiful, isn't it? There's not. I don't. I don't know that there's a country that's not beautiful. I don't think I've been to enough places to answer that. Do you know? Um, but <laughs> but Kamp- everyone must have its beauty. Yeah, exactly. And Kampala, Uganda has it in abundance really it's absolutely stunning um and i've just you know i felt like i had um really understood the rhythm of the country i'd been there on and off for nearly 8 years and my dad who's nigerian he probably wouldn't like to hear this but i felt i feel more ugandan <laughs> than i do nigerian <laughs> 
don't just, tell him that. I know, no, let's keep that between us. Um, I just, yeah, even though the bill's like passed, it's now a law, um, I just can't help but go back. And obviously I'm still involved, not as much as I was, but um, there's just something about that country that just keeps pulling me back. I want to go with you there, but it's let's just go. expensive probably, isn't it? Not really, get on Skyscanner. Um, yeah? Yeah. Are we on. talking hundreds or over a thousand? No, it's not over that. It's not Jamaica. Come on. Um, it's probably, I think I paid like 650, something like that. And they have gone up actually. They used to only be about 450 only, but yeah. Uganda Tourist Board should be paying us for this, shouldn't they? Do you <laughs> Sort of giving them a bit of PR. <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe not all the bad stuff we're talking about as well. But that's why I'm happy that you've, you've talked. And it kind of balances it out. <laughs> yeah. I'm happy you've talked about how nice people are there as, as well because I, I the last thing I would want is for people to hear this and go what's this place uh, Kampala Uganda oh horrible because every society has awful awful things in it you know that's and it's I imagine it's a rarity right what the the child sacrifice stuff there um uh depends who you ask um but generally speaking it's a um I can't bloody well call it a safe country now can I <laughs> because if you're if you're a child then you're yeah, then it's not um all of the time depending on where you are um but there's a lot to see a lot to do and it's a wonderful affordable beautiful city Kampala and I encourage anyone to go I thought of another word instead of activism but I don't know I don't know if this sounds quasi religious though but is this has this become a calling for you uh I think it was it has to have been right like I just shut down everything else in my life and was just like hell for leather um, went for this and I have definitely described this in the past as my calling just because I was a bit wayward before I knew like the only two things I think I've been sure about uh, in my life are the fact that I wanted to get into tv I wanted to be a video editor and I wanted to pursue this and yeah I just felt like both of those I wouldn't say telly is my calling but it was certainly something that I was hell-bent on doing and this has been no different would you would you write a book about this? Because I can see it being turned into a movie or something, particularly about your impact and, and what you did there. Don't know. <laughs> Feels a bit something to think about. Wanky, um, considering that, doesn't it? <laughs> can you Ooh. imagine what? How would you answer that? Like, if somebody <laughs> say your podcasts are so interesting, like I could see this being turned into a movie one day. What do you think? <laughs> if you say yes, you're a dick. If you say no, you're being disingenuous. <laughs> Oh no! Um, like, ah, so you mean so? Yes. So the I'd genuine love, answer is yes. Of course, you would love to. Of course, because yeah. I mean, the it would be such an amazing story. Like the things without, and I'm really not being arrogant. The things I've seen and heard um, are like ridiculous. Um, but at the same time, I certainly wouldn't pursue something like that. I wouldn't go actively looking for that um, that opportunity. No, let things happen as they. I think it's possible, though. It's possible to do something that it that you do because it's worth doing, because it, it spreads the message more, because you're writing a book and it's a good process. And if also like cool things come from that, if also money comes from that, well, who cares? Like that's you know you can do what you want. You can give all that money to charity if it makes you feel better, but it's still the the process of writing it and getting it out there uh, mm. would would really be something. Yeah, do you know? I thought when I got back. I started writing when I got back last year, past last May, I got back and I was like, I have to start writing because this is insane and I will forget all of it if I don't. And I did. And I started thinking, could, could I pretend, could this potentially be a book? And I was just like, I can't be, do you know how long it takes to write a book? <laughs> the, I think the reason that you, you, I've done some podcasts before about why we like scary things. Um, and a lot of it is apparently to do with our evolutionary psychology that if you watch horrible things happening, horrible, horrible, horrible things, uh, it might help you to practice and to know what to avoid yourself. You know, you see someone getting eaten or killed in the wild or whatever. By watching it, it gives you dopamine in your brain or something. Uh, it makes you want to watch it. And then you know how to avoid that. It's that kind of thing. And that's probably why um, we like public executions and public hangings and stuff back in the day. Do you think there's 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 anything to to that in the child sacrifice? I mean, is there a, is there ever like a, a group of witnesses watching? Uh, what do you mean? Sort of okay. Is it a spectator? Like a public thing? Yeah, uh, absolutely not. No. Okay. No, no, no. This no. is this is completely no, very private, hidden. and yeah, yeah, absolutely secretive, and 
uh, secluded and yeah, behind walls <laughs> or within bushes. Yeah, no, 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 absolutely not. Do you think it, it might also just speak to humans? I mean, what does it say to you about humans? Are we, are we naturally violence? Are we suppressing our violence and then using excuses sometimes to be violent? I don't think it's as deep as that, if I'm honest. I think that this is a business. I think that uh, there are those who are not just in Uganda, but um, various different countries in, in, in Africa and in India too, who have realized that there is big, big money in convincing people that sacrificing a child will make them rich. Um, especially in Uganda, it's big business. So I don't really think it's a case of, you know, going back to sort of human, you know, um, these sort of barbaric, um, it's not a case. I don't, I think it's bigger than violence. I, I don't, I don't think that that's as, um, prominent in this situation as really unscrupulous, um, evil people realizing that they can capitalize of people's desperation and where so the money where where is the money in in all of this because obviously we've got uh what's happening is you know because for prosperity and luck and things so where does the what's the what's with the money here so obviously a witch doctor is paid um for their services and the ultimate um you know, one of the most expensive things to ask a witch doctor to do or provide for you is uh, the sacrifice of a child. Uh, so <clears throat> this can cost anywhere from a, about £200, which isn't very much to us, but is a huge amount to a particular witch doctor and can write, you know, rise to thousands and thousands. Um so children are murdered for money. And, you know, it's not just the witch doctor who are paid. Obviously, it's the, it's the person who abducts the child. It's the um, person who goes out to buy the utensils to cut the child. There's, it's such a network. Um, you've got the driver. You've got the person who obtains the phones um, to make, you know, to, to communicate with those involved. Um, so... So yes, it's a uh, it's a very very profitable business. Is it like a, a mafia? And, and are there famous witch doctors? I, I suppose because it's so illegal, they've got to hide. I guess there are, but the, you've got to be quite careful when you kind of. There are witch doctors and traditional healers, right? Um, witch doctors are those who are carrying out um, witchcraft and appeasing ancestral spirits, not necessarily. Um, not necessarily carrying out ch uh, child sacrifice, but it's the witch doctors who are carrying out child sacrifice, amongst other things. And then you've got traditional healers who are, you know, medicine men and women, um, and they use traditional herbs to cure ailments and illnesses, and they're very reputable. Um, so sometimes, th you know, that those lines are blurred, and the traditional healers, especially in Uganda, get a really bad name for themselves because of the reputation of witch doctors who are carrying out these, you know, hideous, hideous acts. And, and, and then was this when you got there, was this legal? No. So it's always been illegal to sacrifice a child, murder a child. But the, the issue was that perpetrators, like defendants were being charged using the penal code, um, which did not um, carry an adequate sentence, in my opinion. Um, and there were significant loopholes in not just the Penal Code, but the um, Anti-Trafficking in Persons Act um, that made it really, really easy for people who are carrying out this crime to be let off. For example, um, you know, if there was a case of a child who was kept in a shrine and she was uh, graduate she was gradually sacrificed and um instead of just you know removing her body parts and leaving her to die she was born for the purpose of sacrifice so over the what? years she was you know they would remove a fingernail it would grow back <gasps> and they'd remove it again they would remove her earlobes teeth um pull out hair by the time i met her she couldn't hear she couldn't see she couldn't speak she was in a wheelchair. It's awful. Um, so 
the guys who who did that to her were charged with kidnap, kidnap and torture, and were given a ridiculously low sentence. So our law um, has that provision uh, of gradual sacrifice, um, and it carries a, a a really really high sentence. So we have thought of every single possible scenario that in, that is involved in sacrificing a child from the moment that call is made to the, the murder of that child and every single stage has a crime attached to it. We have spent so long thinking and thinking and thinking of every possible scenario to make sure that there aren't any loopholes anymore. Yeah. So what kind of things were they like? So now placing a call, that is a crime that will get you a sentence, placing a call to a witch doctor about child sacrifice. Yes. Um, and it's obviously at the judge's discretion. Um, but I know that the, the law has been used a few times now, which I'm insanely proud of um oh yeah yes one of them i think i briefly mentioned about this little boy who survived and he could he could identify his attackers earlier um i mentioned there, was, there were some cases of of that happening and this little boy finally um his perpetrators were caught and they were sentenced so i think it was 44 years which i know doesn't sound very much but we will <laughs> we will appeal that <laughs> He ain't getting out. Um, but he had been, this poor, poor little boy has been living with, they removed his penis, they castrated him and, um, tried to cut his, cut his, um, head off. So he's got this huge scar here. Um, and yeah, he is, he went to Australia for surgery, um, funded by a charity and they just, yeah, they did what they could. Um, but he was living in the same community as the man who, who attacked him and he couldn't do anything because at the time a child's eyewitness account was not enough to secure a conviction. Um, so this guy's now behind bars and I am really thrilled to see that he, this boy has justice, um, and that this bill, this law, I've got to get used to calling it law is being used in the way that it was designed to. I'm insanely proud of it. I'm amazed. I am. And I, I you know, I want to, oh, I don't want to compliment you too much. I don't think you, you don't want it, but I'm just, I, I, I'm amazed by what you've done. I really am. Um, ah, oh, it's, it's funny how that's come about as well, because, you know, the, the Puritans with the witches, that was, that was, the problem was children's eyewitness accounts was putting people into prison, but this is a completely different spin on it. It's like, you, this is a really, really good thing. It's a very good thing. Um, and I have to say, it's, it really is not just me who has uh, pushed this through at all. Um, after a few years, um, I got funding from an incredible UK-based charity called Children on the Edge. Um, and without their help, I certainly wouldn't have been able to, to you know, consider being anywhere near here. <laughs> like they, they resourced, they helped finance this. They did finance it, sorry. Um, offered emotional support, everything. It was just, it, it would, it's impossible to imagine having done this without them. So, and also my team in Uganda as well. So this is not, this is not just me. I want to make that really, really clear. <laughs> yeah. Um, and yeah, I couldn't think about it. It would be impossible to try and take off, take on, um, a mountain like that. You needed, I needed help and help I had. What were some of the challenges you faced in trying to uh, change this law? Um, so we didn't change it. We introduced a specific law. Um, and the challenges were just that, actually. That was one of the main ones that, you know, we came up against so much sort of criticism, like we don't need a, we don't need a new law. We've got the Anti-Trafficking Persons Act. We've got the Penal Code. This is, this is perfectly adequate. No. <laughs> They really aren't, which is why people are getting off left, right and centre. Um, financing. I financed it myself for the first three years. So I was working in London, save up money, come back to Uganda and mobilise MPs. I was very whimsical with the way that I was going about it. Um, not particularly methodical, right? But I didn't really know what I was doing. Um, but it became very, very clear that I needed funding and I contacted Children on the Edge and... Rachel Bentley, the, one of the founders, um, just took, took a chance on me. Um, and I'm forever, forever grateful for their support. So money was a big one. I think, um, you know, often like 
maintaining that sort of momentum <laughs> um because seven years is no joke you know it, it was very much like that um and often i just i thought what am i what am i doing <laughs> i want to go back to london and party <laughs> and just just do nothing, do nothing. That's what I wanted to do. I wanted to do a whole heap of nothing and just forget that this had happened. Cause actually I remember feeling like this is a bloody curse. Cause <laughs> like in the midst of it, you can't walk away once you know something like that's happening. So I felt totally anchored to this. You were stuck, you were, you were stuck to it, but then you got the bill passed with two minutes to spare. Yes. Uh, not two minutes, <laughs> not two <sighs> minutes, uh, two days uh two days okay. to spare yeah um so the ugandan parliament was reaching uh there was going to be a new parliament basically and um at the end of the 10th parliament was ending on the friday and tuesday wednesday thursday three days to spare and yeah we presented on the tuesday um astonishingly um somehow were able to get a slot because we were actually told previously it wasn't going to happen. And I got a call um, in the morning from uh, my colleague in parliament. It was like, we're presenting this bill <laughs> uh, at 10 o'clock. <laughs> and it was like 9 a.m. And uh, I rushed like a bat out of hell um, to parliament in a really, really, really inappropriate jumpsuit. Um, and I jumped, I jumped on the back of a Boda Boda, which is a motorcycle taxi. And, uh, yeah, told the guys to just, just get there, get there as soon as possible. Got to parliament and, uh, met the MP who was presenting the bill. And he was like, well, you, you, you can't enter parliament like that. <laughs> you can't. Like you look, I was like, no, 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 no. This can't happen. I can't not see this happen and pass or fail. Um, I just, I just couldn't let that happen. And somehow I managed to get a friend to bother, bother me some clothes. And, um, I changed in one of the offices and yeah, I was able to, to, to watch it. That would have literally, that would have broken my heart if I wasn't able to, to watch that all because of a fashion faux pas. I would, could you imagine living that down? <laughs> Ridic it would have been ridiculous. These kinds of things. <laughs> but I so should have, mad. no, but I've been in and out of parliament for a long, like I should have known. That, you know, some spotty hipster kind of, no, it wasn't, it wasn't appropriate. Um, but yeah, no, I remember the moment it passed. It was just, it was just something that I will gladly hold on to forever. It was a very, very long process. It was raining and because of COVID, it was in this, um, like outdoor tent and there were mosquitoes everywhere. Um, and, it just went on for something like two and a half hours because there was going through loads of other bills and finally it got to hours and there was like a moment where they were disputing one of the clauses. I was like, oh God, it's not going to happen. And then, uh, yeah, finally, finally it did. Did you feel emotional in the moment that it passed? Yeah, yeah, embarrassingly so. Um, you know, Ugandans are really conservative, um, but <laughs> so emotion and tears and all of that just doesn't really fly not in a professional setting and um the uganda the, the the colleague in parliament who had rang me in the morning had been there from day one in fact he was a legislator who offered to help me for free and so he was sitting to my left and um and he'd never seen me break for, for you know break down like that and it was him who sort of turned to me and said it had passed um and oh gosh, I get emotional thinking about that because, you know, we sort of started it together and we ended it together and yeah, it was just a really, really special moment. Well, you saved a lot of lives. I mean, you, you did more in that moment or in those years than most of us do with our lives. I don't really know how to, what to say to that. I'm just glad it's being used, you know, like it, there was a moment maybe like six months ago where um, <sighs> implementation is a really big part of of um of this like uganda has got lots of laws but unless they're really implemented they don't really do anything and there was a moment a while back that i was like this is just not being used this bill like <laughs> have we done all of this for nothing um and then slowly and surely it started started getting used like the case that i've just told you about so yeah i had a new kind renewed of, no sorry. <laughs> you go. sorry i always i try and cut in you go no, I... i'm sick of talking now 
I always try, I, have I want to, to break. The, 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 thing, the thing about doing this on on online is I always have to try and anticipate when someone's about to finish. So because of just the put your delay, hand up, just put your hand but, up, and but, I'll but stop. Not, but but I don't want you to stop. It's only I only want you to stop if you've actually finished. But I always have to interpret that, that it looks it. like they may be finished. But if they are going to just leave a gap and then they've got more to say, I, I don't want to stop it. Right, I'll put my hand up when I'm finishing. Right, like about two or three words before the end of a sentence. Will that help oh, you out? Yeah. It might look it might look weird though on YouTube. It, That's it the might. Thing. You always put put your hand up. Do you think this will um, stop more of ch- child sacrifice through prevention? You know, s- people know that there's going to be a, a, a higher sentence, or or maybe locking up the offenders so there are fewer of them, fewer of them at large. Mm, I think it will do. It depends. It depends how what the future of this law is really, and if it's con- if it continues to be used in the way that it's being used, I think that it will undoubtedly work as a deterrent. But um, I don't think it will do much more than that. Um, I think I think what's really really important is this stage two, which is what I'm doing now, um, is working on implementation, training up the judiciary so that they know exactly how to use this law. Um, working at the grassroots level to try and convince and educate communities without sounding really wanky and condescending that this is not, this is not the way to go and that there are other ways in which to prosper. Um, they have to work in conjunction. And I genuinely, I feel as though I picked the easy one of the two. Passing a law is like, you know, but convincing, you know, a community where, you know, within the f- whole fabrics of their being is that, you know, you have to appease the ancestral spirits in order to X, Y, and Z. It's going to be really, really hard um, and probably won't be achieved in my lifetime. Um, but they have to work in conjunction. The bill alone will do very, very little, um, I'm afraid to say. It will do some, and the sum is more than enough um, for me. But um, I just I just feel like while I've got the energy and the means and the momentum, I'd just like to continue in this field, really. I suppose there's a weirdness. Do you ever do you ever cross your just so people listening know Annie put her hand up to say she finished. Um there's a there's a weird thing here where it is a case of like wealthier Western people going over i mean you mentioned educate which i was going to ask you next how do we educate people not to do it but it's just occurred to me there is that thing of like us going over and we're going to educate you on how to be at the same time the thing that's happening by our standards just seems so abhorrent that it seems crazy not to try and do that right yeah um yes i think it helps that i'm not white um i don't i think i'd have a hard uh, time i'm still called mzungu over there which is white person because i'm fairer than them um most people um so i still get a tough time in fact i'm probably i'm probably seen as white in fact i am but i think they wouldn't admit it but i think that they're more susceptible to maybe listening to some of my ideas than they might do if maybe you went sure. over you know sure. so there's i've got that up my sleeve but that's about it <laughs> that is about is it. it weird is it weird feeling white there yeah i don't like it no offense <laughs> i don't because i'm not it's taking away my blackness like and my identity so yeah it's not nice it's annoying but i got used to it but to be called mzungu all the time right which is you white person <laughs> it's just like come on I learned the word for mixed race, but, um, and we just, um, would, would shout it back, but, um, muchutala, that's it, muchutala. Uh, but it just didn't really stick. Yeah. I got caught when I was in Argentina, in South America, I was gringo, obviously, all the time. Oh, yeah, gringo yeah. this, gringo that, yeah. which, which it was annoying again because that's an American. That's supposed to yeah. be American. I had to, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not them. I'm not, I'm not Yankee, as they would say, you know. No. Yeah. Um, and, and then, uh, oh, yeah, go on. What were you going to no, say? No, no, I wasn't actually. I was just filling the silence. Are there still <laughs> are there still places uh, in other parts of Africa or other parts of the world uh, that you know of where this goes on? Yes, uh, Botswana, uh, Nigeria, parts of Ghana, um, uh, 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 and India is specific, like particularly bad. There was a, there was a moment last year where when during, 
I felt really galvanized and <clears throat> there's an organization who helped us kind of helped inform us um, when it came to the bill and writing legislation because in legislation what legislators borrow from other existing laws to create their own provisions it's above board it sounds really kind of cagey like they're pla plagiarizing they're not and we borrowed a lot from the existing laws in India that outlaw this practice and um, <clears throat> I got taught talking to a, a charity over there who are really keen to introduce specific legislation on this and uh, and I just learned how I mean I thought Uganda was bad but um, India ha has a real serious problem um, not all over and don't ask me where I can't quite remember but um, I thought perhaps I could then sort of take the you know law and the team that I'd worked with over there and, and start helping them but I, I don't have the time I don't have the time no I can't I it was too much for one person it is yeah I feel bad saying that <laughs> what was the um, I, I forgot to ask you about the boy who was lured to buy soap by his uncle yeah what about him? What was his story? So there are two twin boys, um, brothers, who uh, were at home one day and their uncle asked them to come to the shop with him and told them that he that they were off to buy soap and he took them into the bush and uh, sat one of them down and sacrificed the other one in front of his brother. Uh, he cut off his head and removed his genitals. Um, and his, yeah, was just left, 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 left to die. Um, while his brother watched on completely helpless. Um, and that, that is, I mean, that happens all the time, by the way. Um, it's not, it's not uncommon. It's horrible. However, not uncommon, uncommon. The issue with, one of the many issues with this is that the whip, the the uncle was found by the mob justice before the police could really get get to him, and he was burnt alive. And they took it into their own hands to to deal with him as they saw fit. Um, yeah, his brother. So the boy is now twelve, and he's doing very well. He's um, he's in school. I spoke to him literally a couple of weeks ago. Um, so he's got the support around him. I think that he needs, um, and he's doing all things considered well, I think. That's amazing to hear. And, but, but hor horrific what he went through and horrible. Um, I, and I guess that's, you know, a, a place to sort of come to an end and, and ask like, w is there much that listeners can, can do to help or, or to find out more, you know? Mm, that is a good question. Do you know what? There's not enough out there on... When I was trying to research this, um, the first article I put in Child Sacrifice, Uganda, and there was this, you know, the first article I read was this Daily Mail. Um, horrible, mm. sensational, no offence to Daily Mail listeners or, you know, mm. workers. <laughs> but it just was <laughs> completely inaccurate. It was just awful. So many holes. There's not enough information out there, which I am working on. Um, but I think there's, there's always funding that needs to be, I don't want to ask for money. Um, I'm not going to do that. Um, but if, if you would like to help, um, we, I am, you know, introducing this second phase where <clears throat> implementation is so important. I have set up a GoFundMe page, um, which I, I cannot believe, um, has, done so well every day I seem to get a little um a, a donation and I think it's unbelievable there's no pressure whatsoever to donate do if you want don't worry if you don't but there's that um and I think I'm just working on a way to make this information accessible to people not just through the means of podcasts and just because I think it's really important that people know what's going on in their world well I am going to pressure people to give their money to you to contribute to that your GoFundMe nice. thank but you that's me doing it everyone yeah do go check what just Annie Iqba, um GoFundMe I don't know I think so I can't uh <laughs> the children on the edge set it up um this is how I just 
I don't know. Can I tell you? Could you link to it, maybe? Yeah, I mean, anyone who does, it's wonderful of you. I mean, typically, typically a lot of listeners buy uh, uh, the book of of one of my guests, you know. So I think if they spent the equivalent on on paying towards this, and this is paying towards helping you go out and you know um, change things out there and hopefully save some lives. So uh, um, Annie, thank you for being on the edge. What a fantastic guest you've been. Thank you. Ah, oh, it's been really, really good. I think. Thank you for giving um, me the platform to talk about something that's really important to me and that should be should be spoken about way more often thank you hi i'm andrew gold former bbc journalist i got a little tired of restrictions over who i could interview and what i could say and do so i made this channel click this playlist here and i'll be seeing you on the edge